Welcome to today's episode of Coffee with Chris. We have an interesting show planned for you today with a very unique guest and a neat little invention that he'll talk about that you'll see coming down the road in the future. But first of all, we want to talk about a few announcements here at Logic Central. First of all, you'll see us now on YouTube, all our podcasts where you can see my smiling face and a lot of our unique guests as well. Uh, so feel free to listen to us on YouTube or on audio as we have been podcasting in the past. And also we have a new line of podcast with uh, two podcasts starting. One here is already up. You can find it. It's called New Cyber Frontier. You can find it at newcyberfrontier.com, newcyberfrontier.co, and newcyberfrontier.news. The next look for in the September time frame, it'll be on intercultural leadership with a great host that we'll introduce you to a little bit later on down the road. Uh, but the New Cyber Frontier is available now you can find trailers to all the guests that we're going to interview. We have quite a season planned. Uh, we are following the cybersecurity economic development effort in the state of Colorado. Here in Colorado, the governor has uh, deemed that cybersecurity be the primary focus for the city of Colorado Springs and put a lot of money and resources and time for the whole state behind this economic development effort that will bring in many countless jobs and opportunities in the state as well as support the cybersecurity growth and industry development worldwide. We look for this being an exciting time in cybersecurity and a, a really great opportunity for a lot of people to become involved and build economic prosperity for this local area as well as the rest of the world. But join the podcast as it comes on. Sign up for our new Cyber Frontier mailing list so we can make sure we get a message out to you every time we have a release, an announcement, and a new podcast because these things are going to come and go fast and this growth is going to be tremendous. And so this is a great time in this area and for cybersecurity around the world. We hope you enjoy these new podcast series as much as I did interviewing all these people to bring these messages to you. Also, the last announcement is that now you'll see that some sponsors for these shows, both in the video and in the audio form, please check out their sites. If they didn't align with our message, we wouldn't have them on, but you'll find their links on the pages as well. We have the Cyber Resilience Institute, which helps build communities to keep our homeland secure. We have the Internet Broadcasting Network. Check them out if you're looking to find ways to get messages out by sponsoring a radio show or having your own. And we also have Logic Central Online with many offerings you can see at www.lifelogic.info. All the offerings for Logic Central Online leadership for the technological era. But please visit our sponsors and when you contact them, let them know you heard about them here on the Coffee with Chris podcast. Thanks a lot and we hope you enjoy today's show. So welcome to today's episode of Coffee with Chris. Uh, we have a guest today and he is someone I met locally here in Colorado Springs and just has the neatest little um, shop that uh, he is the founding, one of the founding members of the Pikes Peak Makerspace, which uh, he's going to tell you about it, but it's a place where uh, young people and adults can go kind of use machine tools and shop type of equipment to do their own project. And that was really interesting, but also mm -hmm. Greg Cook who is our guest today, is the CEO of Trappy, which we will also talk about a really interesting new invention. Um, and I'll let him introduce that one. But Greg, welcome today. How are you? Doing well, Chris. Uh, wonderful day. Beautiful here in Colorado. Yeah, it is a beautiful day here. So Greg, tell us a little bit about, first of all, about your background. What are you about as a person? Well, let's see. Um, we're talking technology, so I'll talk uh, I'm a computer science graduate from Wright State University. It's a Wright State University for you in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, yeah, computer science. Tell us about your, you know, how you got to the, the Pikes Peak Makerspace. Uh, All right. So the, wonder, the wonders of meetup.com. The uh, Pikes Peak Makerspace. So I met up on meetup.com through the 3D printer meetup. And Chris, the founder of that meetup, was also forming the makerspace. And so we connected. There's two kind of entrepreneurial communities here. Um, you go over to Epicentral. That's another, it's a co-working space and it's mostly software based um, over there. 
we call it the clean space. And then you have the, the maker space, which is what we call the dirty space. Over here, we create dust and flame. And, and I noticed that in my career, er, only very early did I work um, on software and it was really like operating systems. So I was down in the hardware. And then through my career, I kept noticing that there was always some physical component to what I was doing, either putting things in racks or cabling things up or you know, I'm a hammer radio operator. I was always physical. And I went to makerspace and I go, these are cool. And it's like, do I belong over in Epicentral or do I belong? I, no, I belong in a makerspace. And out of the makerspace, in fact, came uh, is coming my company. Interesting. So tell us about what the makerspace is. Explain that and what type of people come in there. Okay, so think of a gym membership. You go to the gym and you, you uh, rent the, the workout equipment. Well, a makerspace is, is like a gym membership, except you rent. Uh, you come and join and you get a key and you come in and you use 3D printers and laser cutters and we have an electronic shop and a welding area and a wood shop and all the things you need to make something in the physical world. And we have training classes. We have uh, people who we work together on projects. Um, in fact, one of our community projects is called Delaney's Hand. We are uh, 3D printing a prosthetic for a little girl. We, we, in fact, delivered the first one. It doesn't quite fit her arm, so we're still working on it. But it's an open source project. And uh, our goal is, instead of prosthetics cost, costing $100,000, they're going to cost less than 1000 by using 3D printing. Yeah, I've heard some there's, there's amazing breakthroughs in the medical field from 3D printing. Mm -hmm. So we have that, um, and, I, and I'll pivot on to what I'm doing. I'm going to give you a little story. Uh, we entered a thing called the IP Smart Objects Challenge. This was in 2015. And we pulled um, a bunch of us together, and we went through what are called agile brainstorming exercises. You can look them up online, and you can see the different ones. But we had a diverse group of people. You know, Again, me as the old person, we had a high school student, every age in between, men, women different levels of experience and their backgrounds. And we went through these exercises and we came up with five ideas that we submitted to the IP Smart Objects Challenge. Okay, so there are 54 worldwide entries, 14 from Colorado, 10 got to go to California in the finals. Three of them came out of the makerspace. And the people running the contest asked, how did you do that? Um, and in fact, two of the ideas are being carried forward. One is an intelligent food tray for hospitals. And then what I'm working on is, in fact, a better mousetrap. <laughs> we talked about this a little bit before, and I was kind of tripped out. I was like, well, how can you make a better mousetrap? But you're kind of combining the old and the new, the physical and the virtual. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, okay, so the story is I'm, you know, I'm watering my plants and these flies are buzzing around my head and I go, oh, I wonder where those come from. And I look, look beside my fireplace and there's this little wooden mousetrap with a dead mouse full of maggots. And I went, I wish that would have known that. And we painted a picture there. Thank you. Yep, yep. So uh, what we were building, we're not building a mousetrap, but in fact, we're building a little carrier that you can slide the mousetraps into. The violence of the trap going off triggers a sensor, which sends a message to the cloud. You get an alert on your phone, and the pest control company gets an optimized route to go service this customer. Okay. So you we, don't have to... In fact, I, I showed this to some patent guys, and, and I think I accidentally met the guy who reviews the mousetrap patents, and he said, boy... I thought I'd seen everything and make sure everything's in the patent. I went, okay, cool. <laughs> so wild. So where are you at in the stage of this mousetrap? Is it ready to launch to consumers? Can you pick one up today? Not yet. Um, I think that's about a year out when the pest control companies will start getting it. Okay, so, so this will kind of pivot back. I mean, we we're going to talk a little bit about security before. But... Um, What's going on in the Internet of Things space? Well, before we switch over to, I'm sorry, go ahead. Before we switch over to technical, though, I want to know what else is in store for the, the mousetrap. When I think pest control, there's a lot more than just mousetraps there. There's traps for larger animals. There's um, 
you know, like insects and things like that. Do you, do you plan on going a little bit further down the road with this? Oh, yes, yes. Okay. So um, I, I don't envision building little teeny ones for cockroaches. But what we are going to do is we're, we're starting with these kill traps, you know, the little wooden ones that you're, everybody is used to. The patent was like from 1894. Uh, and in fact, there are 4,500 4, mousetrap patents and a new one is submitted every day. And we are just another one of them. Um, but what we will do is we will pivot off of the kill traps on the live traps. There's little tilt traps. Those don't work because people, so I have a friend who, well, I caught a mouse. I used it one time. I caught a mouse and three days later, the dead mouse was in it. It's because he wasn't alerted. So what am I doing? I'm alerting on capture. And going back to what you were talking about, that, you know, squirrels and raccoons and yeah. So I have a friend, uh, she got a raccoon wrangler and he caught a raccoon and it was outside in the sun and she was so upset she, she put an umbrella over it so that the raccoon wouldn't get heat stroke <laughs> because the, the pest control guy wasn't alerted. Right now, pest control people charge their customers to drive around and check the traps. You know where that business model is going. Once I do what I'm doing, I'm going to disrupt a significant portion of the pest control industry. Interesting. Now, not an industry I've been very familiar with, so I would have to say I never even really thought about that there would be people driving around checking traps. Um, yep. And they charge people to do it and waste gas and waste time. Interesting. This, uh, the makers, maker space. What, who's in there? What can we do if, if we wanted to get involved? And uh, what, what type of, uh, you know, what's it cost? All right. Uh, I'll start with cost, really. That one's really easy. It's $55 a month down here in Colorado Springs. Uh, so the other maker spaces around the state are a little higher. Um, and then we have like a family membership for 75 and then you can buy space in here for 175 like eight square feet kind of thing. Um, yeah, yearly. I mean, there's a variety of things. Okay, so that's cost. Easy one out of the way. Um, now, who comes here? Why don't I tell, talk a little about the history of it? So... Chris and Natalie, uh, Chris, I, uh, he's from the technical side and Natalie's from the artistic side. Natalie kind of had an artist makerspace here in Manitou. And Chris was looking to build a makerspace. Turns out they knew each other. So he comes over here and he looks and he goes, well, this will work. Meaning there were artists here. Um, and there was a MIG welder and a TIG welder and a plasma cutter and some shop tools and woodworking stuff. But they were all used up. They were artists, right? They wore out the tips on the plasma cutter and they, um, the blades on the saws were all worn down and, and it was kind of in disrepair and the artists had all left. And here comes Chris and me and all of us engineers and we look at, well, well, I can fix that. Well, I can fix that. Well, I can fix that. So we started fixing everything and all the equipment's coming back online and, 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 and we're working and, and now we look at it and go, well, now what are we doing here? Sure, would be nice to have some artists. <laughs> so lo and behold, artists are coming back and they're going, hey, here's this cool stuff. And one of our most interesting devices here is, in fact, uh, the laser cutter. Okay, $10,000 device. Okay, what artist is going to afford that out of the gate? Not many. What kind of a laser, do, what's, what type of a laser is it? Is it a CO2 laser? Uh, let me look it up. Um, it's, it, we have an Epilogue Zing laser. They're locally made here in um, Colorado over in Golden. In fact, our 3D printers are made up in Fort Collins. We try to source local first. Uh, I, oh, if you don't know, I'm just curious, um, curious what, what kind it? of power uh, I could imagine. Don't look at the shiny thing. The laser cutter is a shiny thing for me, and I haven't looked at it much yet, but I can tell you whatever their people are doing. <laughs> That, that's okay. I was just wondering if you knew off the top of your head. No, There's a couple no, of different types I've worked with lasers before in the past for cutting steel, actually, in, in yeah. that industry. Yeah. Some pretty powerful this one devices. Glass and wood. And, um, and so the artists come in and we show them how I use it. And it's like, well, that's really cool. Well, that's really cool. So we had one artist come in. It was very courteous. He would come in at 11 o'clock at night and work until eight in the morning, five days a week. And in three months, he created all of his art and then went out. And he sold all those art 
And we haven't seen him because he probably sold enough to buy himself his own laser cut. So in fact, the makerspace's purpose is to jumpstart companies and jumpstart artists into new things and jumpstart creative people into new things. And that there's one example where we succeed. Yeah. So, I mean, these type of places, almost things of the past, it used to be that physical shops were everywhere, but they're almost becoming you know, hard to find. That's why I was so interested when I ran into you and in talking about this. Do you, uh, even at like schools and technical schools, a lot of times they're, they're light on the, the shops and the actual equipment. Do you work with any of the local universities or colleges to offer this space to them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, Chris, in fact, um... UC, or excuse me, uh, CC has a uh, like 25 member um, ticket and they just rotate students through and students go, hey, anybody want to go over to the makerspace? And here, here, here's one of your 25. And so all through the year, we get students rolling in and out, depending on what courses they're taking or what they're doing. Right now they're off for the summer. We haven't seen much of them, but uh, in fact, we had two students here very serious and uh, I had a, what's called a paste extruder. It's used for printing, 3D printing food. And then one of the students goes, well, that thing's really cool. We can pick up girls with that thing. And I go, here you go. Bring it back at the end of the summer. So they're off like, yeah, printing food and, and, and picking up girls. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, definitely interesting. Um, so how can people get involved? How can people contact you? What, uh, do you have a website? Yes. Okay. So there's the Pike Speak Makerspace.org. We're on Facebook. Uh, if you look us up on meetup.com, you'll find the calendar and you just show up anytime you want. You see somebody around and give you a tour. Um, but I, I thought I'd announce a couple other things that are coming up. Um, let's see. One is 101010.net. Okay. So on Friday night up in Denver, there's an organization, organization called 101010. It's in 10 days, 10 entrepreneurs work on 10 wicked problems. So they are near the end of that exercise. And so Friday night is the big reveal. Uh, you know, uh, uh, well, it's a big display of what they've come up with. They've been working on it for the past two weeks. And these are entrepreneurs that have plucked off the beach and been told to work on Elon Musk size problems. And so, and so Friday night, um, you can look on 9101010.net and you can get the details there. So is this something that it's a spectator sport or something that you're looking for the 10 people to work on? What's the, what are you, what's the ask here? Uh, the ask is, is look on the website and go to the um, celebration on Friday night and watch what they've come up with. Okay, we'll have to check it out and uh, they put a link up on this podcast to see if we get uh, um, the, to actually to the, I don't know if it's going to go live before that time. No, that's this week. Yeah, so that's, Okay, uh, the next one is uh, Peak Startup. Uh, that is the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial group over at Epicentral and yeah, in the community here. Um, I pitched last Thursday night. Once a month, there's a pitch. Um, if you want to know what's going on in the entrepreneurial community, um, you go to that. Um, you also go to one thing called uh, One Million Cups, which is on Wednesday mornings at 9 o'clock. So if you look up One Million Cups in Colorado Springs, you can get the details there. And then, like you mentioned lastly, the Pike Speak Makerspace. Um, we are opening up another site in progress, so we're going to expand. And then uh, you can find uh, interesting things or what, what are called maker fairs and the what if festival that's the maker community down here and, and those will be in the fall yeah so definitely uh, want to get everybody involved with the startup community around here it's been i've been involved with all these events you're talking about except for the 10 10 10 and uh it, it's a good thing to go out and join our local community see what's buzzing here in colorado springs so i appreciate having you on greg you know, I always ask somebody and open up putting you on the spot you know you've been around for a couple of years mm -hmm. what advice mm -hmm. Would you give somebody starting out in life or a younger person to say, this is something that I wish I would have learned earlier in my life that would have made me much more successful, stable, happier, 
any of the above. Okay, Chris. Um, let me talk about one thing about, uh, I'll stay on the subject of business. Um, so the advice is don't go it alone. Okay, so um, I bump into people who are starting company. Um, in fact, uh, Rachel yesterday, you know, she's got a company going, she's trying to grow it. And I, I talked about the people are in her company and it turns out it's her and her mom and her sister. I described these people. She goes, I go, are you guys all organized? She goes, yeah, we all are. I'm like, hmm. I go, you lack your piston. And she asks, what, what do you mean? I go, I describe it as pistons and flywheels. I, Greg Cook, is a piston. Chris Vestal, the organizer of the big makerspace, is a flywheel. Him and I work well together because I'm good at getting things started and getting things finished, but I struggle in the middle. And Chris has trouble getting started, executes, and will polish the car until the paint's gone, until somebody tells him to stop. So figure out, are you a piston or are you a flywheel? And if you want to form a company, find your partner. And they're often one of your friends or somebody that uh, you already know, especially if you've already got a company and you're struggling like Rachel was. And I go, you probably know your piston. She goes, I know who she is. And I go, number one thing to do is find your piston. Another example was there was a person who was a piston and I said, you've got to go fly in your flywheel. <laughs> if you do that, your company takes off. I don't go it alone. Yeah. That's a, a great advice. And um, thanks for joining. Yeah, but it's, job, it's even true like in relationships or anything else. Yeah. yeah. Your, your partner is usually your opposite. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for joining today, Greg. Uh, we definitely want to direct people to check out the Pikes Peak Makerspace and uh, also the uh, local startup community events that Greg said. But thanks a lot for joining today, Greg. You can have a okay, great day. Okay, appreciate it, Chris. All right. Bye. Okay. Oh, bye.